are tycoons of small biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. Backbone Financial, the show's sponsor, is a marketing name for business conducted through Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your host, Austin L. Peterson, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin connects with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz. We are very excited to have with us today uh, what I would call a Phoenix business superstar, Brenda Schmidt. Uh, We're excited to have her in. She's uh, CEO, or excuse me, she is founder and uh, executive chair of Solera and CEO of Coplex. And we're excited to have her in studio today and and, uh, be able to get her feeling on what's going on today in the the business world, innovation-wise, COVID-19, lots of topics that we'll cover today. So we're very excited to have you here today, Brenda. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Austin. Brenda, like uh, like I mentioned, we, we wanted to kind of get your your thoughts and feelings on what's going on in innovation. But before we do that, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. Give us some information for those of our listeners who may not know your story as well as I do or as, as well as many people do. So tell us about a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today. And, and then we'd love to hear about your family life as well and, and uh, anything else that you'd like us to hear. Sure. Yeah, I took a little bit of a circuitous route into entrepreneurship. I actually have a science background. My undergrad was in microbiology. Then I got a master's in immunology and realized that wasn't the path that I wanted to take for the rest of my life. So I actually went out and went into pharmaceutical sales, which was um, my first foray into, into the business world and, and then spent 15 years with Baxter Healthcare. And you know, looking back at my career, I've really been a hand raiser. And the 15 years I spent with Baxter just really established a phenomenal training ground for quality product management, software development. Um, in the last six years I was with Baxter, I actually was responsible for one of the divisions um, in Latin America. And so it was really an entrepreneur in terms of having a, a $92 million P&L and, and just the opportunity to, to be pretty independent within a large Fortune 100 company. Uh, but I had three little kids, so uh, you know, I couldn't spend all my time in Latin America. So uh, again, I was a hand raiser. And when Baxter was laying people off, I said, hey, it, lay me off because I had 18 months of severance huh. after having been there 15 years. I don't think that happens uh, very much anymore. And so I, um, I started my first company in 2005 and bootstrapped that, which was, um, you know, one experience, you learn how to manage cash really well. And then um, really over the course of the 10 years with that business, identified a, a, a niche in the market that became Solera. So did an asset sale, went out, got Series A funding uh, and started Solera um, at the end of, of 2015 and had great product market fit. We, we grew that company from you know, zero to 26 million in, in 36 months, raised 72 million in capital. Um, but I'm a builder. I love building things. And so um, the, the opportunity to, to start something else and really take the helm at Coplex to, to um, understand how I can apply my skill set across different industries and verticals and is, is really exciting. So yeah, that's, that's my, my history in a, in a nutshell. So now my kids are grown, uh, 30, 23 and 20. I have two over at ASU. Uh, and now I have more time on my hands to do fun things. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I would I would start by saying forks up, of course, right? We've got to represent the Sun Devils. Uh, I've yeah. got a son. I, I mentioned before we jumped on that I've got a son at ASU as well. He's studying at the Cronkite School of Journalism, so we're we're big fans of of ASU and what they do. And and I think nationally that we do have some national listeners. I think nationally ASU gets a bad rap as a party school, and and it's really a quality institution that doesn't get recognized as as much as it should. I think in uh, in the national. Uh, atmosphere, so to speak. So, yeah. So, yeah. Well, he was, he wanted to go into engineering and and super smart kid. And I said, you can go wherever you want. And he said, I want to go to ASU. And then once I started actually looking at the quality of the engineering program, I'm like, why would you go anywhere else but ASU? So we had a had a similar a similar experience. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the Fulton School, I think, is the engineering school, right? It's a high quality education. And I, I remember having a conversation with my son, too, who was looking at all of the journalism schools. And, and I said, you know, you're not even looking at, at applying at ASU. It's the Cronkite School of Journalism, for crying out loud. And he looked at me and said, who's Walter Cronkite? <laughs> so, <laughs> you make you go yeah. old, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it's those types of things that make us realize how much older we are than our kids, right? So yeah. uh, that, that puts us right back in, in our place. So I, I think your journey's been incredible, right? And, and you know, where Solera is today and, and where you brought it to, and then just the fact that you're you're kind of not really taking a step back, I would say, but jumping into something new where you have more of an impact on the building, like you said, right? Because you, you called yourself a builder, which I think right. is awesome. And, and for those who don't know, I mean, tell us what Coplex is and what Coplex does on a day-to-day basis um, for entrepreneurs. And then I want you to lead right into that, into what you think the current state of innovation is today. Yeah, it's interesting. I've I've known Zach for for years, um, the co-founder and and CEO of of Coplux, and we started having some conversations around um, his vision and thought leadership and my skill set. So came in in February and um, spent a couple months as president and and really recognized that what Coplux has built and the skill set of the the folks there could really be expanded into helping large corporations innovate faster. And so I think this, I'm, I'm there to really lead this next chapter of Coplex to really, uh, I think, um, combine the, the flexibility, innovation, and speed of a startup methodology with the need for large companies to actually innovate faster and disrupt their own industries. So if you look at somebody like um, McKinsey said, you know, 80% of corporate executives feel that their business are, are at risk for disruption. And you see all the venture money going into these startups. And so um, I think the, the companies are really looking at how they're doing innovation very differently. And there's some white space there that Coplex can take advantage of in a variety of different industries. Brenda, obviously we are living in unique times right now. Um, but even prior to these times, I, I think that innovation is starting to be realized in so many different industries. Uh, Even our own industry, we are seeing things change uh, on on a daily basis. So we're we're trying to keep up best we can. But it just seems so so relevant to talk to you right now because of the the, the times that we're living in right now. So kind of the the follow-up here is... um, you know, with the current pandemic, how, how, in your experience here, how, how is this, the times that we're living in right now, how are, how are they affecting innovation with some of these companies that you, that you see and have experience with? Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of those inflection points that we'll look back and say, wow, this really was made a difference in how people thought about innovation and and where we really focus is around digital business models, whether that's SaaS or you know platforms or two sided marketplaces. And there's a lot of both regulatory and market tailwinds now to help fuel uh, folks thinking about digital business models. If you think about the restaurants that went to takeout, and that was just a, a really horrible experience for a lot of people because that wasn't a business model that they needed before. Now you've got all these people out of work, and so there's this explosion of two sided marketplaces where companies are starting to play safety workers or risk managers or restaurant workers like a quick, um, that those those business models are starting to emerge. And so I think it's also feeling that anything that should be on a, is on a spreadsheet can be digitized and the efficiency that's needed in this market right now. But you know, I've spent my whole career in healthcare and just the adoption of telehealth in the last two months when that industry has been out there for 10 years, there's just a lot of, of tailwinds that are starting to really fuel certain business segments that there's a lot of opportunity. And you saw see the people now who are uh, have the opportunity to reevaluate their business model and pivot and take advantage of some of the the new reality or the the new normal next normal I think that we're all experiencing. Yeah, when things started to really get get serious, I was uh, I, I had to get on my phone to speak with a physician, you know, over over the phone, and this was probably in early March. Fast forward to probably. 
early to mid April. Uh, my stepson wasn't feeling well. So we got back on the same app to try to connect with a doctor. And when, uh, when I tried to connect with somebody, you know, there was two or three people waiting. I was able to get on and connect with a physician in about maybe 15 or 20 minutes. The second time it took us about two and a half hours because there was, there was about 50 people waiting in line per physician and they had, you know, half a dozen or a dozen physicians that you could choose from. So uh, it's, it's pretty crazy how, how quickly things have been, things have been moving. Yeah. Well, especially around telehealth, you had three convergent um, things happening. You had one, people are just more comfortable with video chats, right? We're on video all day long now conducting business and then awareness. A lot of people didn't realize that telehealth was available to them. And third was the reimbursement. You know, once the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services made telehealth reimbursable for Medicare, all of a sudden it became a real viable business. And so see a lot of folks taking advantage of that. But that, that's just one example, I think, of how digital business models are going to start to really emerge. And it's putting pressure on companies. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, Coplex is looking to pivot into that area. Um, if you fit, think about kind of the, the progression of innovation in companies. You had, you know, R&D and, and labs, and, and then it really progressed into corporate venture capital and some M&A. But what we're really seeing now is the sort of corporate venture builder around those companies needing to take their best ideas and, and, and put them into autonomous business units and spin out companies, that they have significant advantages in doing that over a startup who are, who are going to dis, either disrupt themselves or they're going to be disrupted by somebody coming into their industries. So we're seeing a lot more focus on, um, on, on those types of strategies within companies now. Yeah, I think, I think that's a huge point, right? I mean, when, when I went out on my own and, and started building my own business, many of the reasons were things that you mentioned, right? Where it's large organizations and I would raise my hand and say, well, why don't we do this or couldn't we do this? And, and the response that you get is, well, that's, that's not the way we do it. Or mm -hmm. we've always done it that way. So why would we change it, right? And, and it does happen that way a lot in large organizations. And so I think you're really onto something where they create separate business units or they have, you know, an innovations unit or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, you can fill us in more on, on what it is specifically that you're recommending that they do. But when you've got people who are constantly looking at the business to identify opportunities to do something different and innovative, you know, we don't have to go that far to look at businesses that you thought would be around forever. Blockbuster comes to mind, right? You thought Blockbuster Video would be around forever and you couldn't fathom them not being there. And now, you know, not only did it go from Blockbuster to Netflix with the DVD delivery at home to then full online streaming, right? And we may even look at it now and say, well, they can't do anything besides streaming. I mean, what, what's more useful or, you know, right. user-friendly than streaming? But there are other innovations that will come in many, many industries. And you're right, the small, the small businesses tend to be getting all of that funding because they're not bogged down in the corporate culture or the issues that, that go on in large organizations. And they're just looking at things differently. And, and you know, whether it's social impact businesses or what, you know, many different things that are being looked at differently by the newer and the younger entrepreneurs today compared to in the past. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's di very difficult for larger organizations to disrupt themselves because all of their um, incentives are aligned with typically quarterly performance. And so you've got um, sort of unwielding corporate governance. You've got legacy technology. Um, you have an incentive to drive performance and um, it's really difficult and, and just DNA of the culture of the company. And it's really difficult. I, I say it all, uh, all uh, just this past week, we were having a, a workshop with a large company and they were like, oh, but we'd have to build up this infrastructure and we'd have to do this and do that. And I said, if you were a startup, what would you do? What would you do to disrupt you? And you wouldn't have all of that infrastructure and you wouldn't have all of the things that they're thinking about. You do it very um, scrappy. You know, I go, you've got to think scrappy and, and that's, it's sort of, so how can we have the foundation of a fortune 100 company and all of the great learnings and industry expertise and clients with the scrappiness of a startup? And I think that's what we're really trying to infuse in these companies with an outside perspective. Yeah, I think, I think it's hugely important. I mean, one of the, probably the biggest lesson that I 
remember from business school. And I tell people all the time that the, the biggest value that I got from going and getting an MBA was really about the network of people that I met and the ideas that were exchanged rather than the education itself. Not that the education is not useful, but I, I personally believe the network was more useful to me. Um, but one thing that I that I take away and I really try to make sure that I put that to the forefront all the time is the concept of sunk cost, right? So many businesses get wrapped up in, well, we spent millions of dollars building this. And so we've got to make this work. Well, the reality is that money's already spent. And so it shouldn't dictate how you make your decisions going forward. Mm -hmm. And it's a really hard concept for business owners or unit leaders or whatever it is to to actually live by that day in and day out because they know that they made a decision that may have been wrong and they spent millions of dollars making that wrong decision, right? Yeah. Well, what we see now is a lot of companies are recognizing the need for an autonomous business unit that sits outside of corporate governance. And so they take their people and they put them in this innovation lab um, and they spend you know millions of dollars and nothing comes out the other end. And it really is because you've taken those people that just don't have that um, startup methodology. And they look at it in a lot of instances as a portfolio of products as opposed to a portfolio of companies. And they don't have the rigor around stage gating. When you're a startup and you don't have a lot of cash, you get very disciplined around pivot, perish, or persevere, right? And let the best ideas come and, and push those out as opposed to, um, you know, just keep putting money in because it's somebody's project. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the advantages is really helping them um, harness their ideas from across the company and then figuring out which ones are those the best ones and then and then helping them you know execute effectively that's just not in not in their DNA. So you, you already mentioned you know restaurants pivoting to delivery, right? And we're seeing more and more community kitchen type setups, right? Where you've got multiple brands sharing a kitchen and they're doing delivery only, no in-house dining, all that kind of stuff. And so though, you know that's an example of something that's changing, right? Any any other examples you'd give us of of things that are already changing either due to the COVID-19 pandemic or just kind of what's going on in the in the marketplace today and and what forces do you think are driving that change? Yeah, I think the the forces that are driving is is a need for efficiency. People are worried about cash and they're realizing, wow, I could actually do things differently and be more efficient and, and cash efficient. And um, and then I think there's a really big focus, and this has happened for a long time around user experience. Like how can we take experiences and make them really good. Amazon has sort of spoiled us all, but there's a lot of really frustrating experiences out there that there's successful businesses that could be disrupted by people just making the consumer experience better. To your point around, you know, spending, um, you know, two and a half hours on the phone. Uh, there's a lot of those experiences. And, and the other piece around, I think, even in, in insurance, um, you know, starting to think about, well, if physicians aren't doing as many elective surgeries, are they uh, paying for insurance that they don't need? Right, because they're not it, so. So all of a sudden, you get into a little bit more uh, flexibility around things that have typically been, you know, capitated or a certain rate. And so people are really thinking outside the box around disrupting their own industries and some of the things that they're they're thinking about. But even around, you know, I talked to someone the other day. There's quite a few folks who are looking at automatic. Uh, temperature readings when you walk into a building, right? Like, like yeah. uh, just just things that all of a sudden COVID has put into place that you didn't you didn't think about before, and not touching things, right? The ability to pay and order on your phone when you're sitting in a restaurant and having all that conductivity. So, those are the sorts of things that that people are being really really creative about. And I think with with companies, they do really well with call Horizon One. I'm selling a um, my existing product to a new client, or I'm selling a new product to an existing client. But when they get into Horizon 2, which is adjacencies, or Horizon 3, which is really transformational, it is just not what they're good at to, to try to implement those adjacent or transformational strategies within their existing business structure. We free you from the tasks of today, so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Paylocity, American provider of cloud-based payroll, and human capital management software for small, medium, and large size organization. Paylocity, forward together, always here for you. Paylocity.com. So, Brenda, love to love to get some thoughts uh, around 
just continuing the conversation of, of innovation, but maybe just in a little bit different context here. So a lot of businesses are facing difficult times, as you are, are, are well aware and as, as our listeners are well aware, of course. So as the businesses that are able to survive uh, these times and, and, and re, re-emerge, and as they are thinking about their strategy and their business models and, and all that comes with you know, these, these changes that we're presented with, you know, to you, Brenda, what does it mean to you to kind of start to, to reimagine innovation? And how do, you, how do you put that into play? Yeah, when we, we use the word a lot around reimagine is really looking at things through a different new lens, given all of the changes that have happened. So I think there's, there's two ways to look at it. One is reimagining how folks have traditionally done innovation. Um, and, and when we think about reimagining in that way, it really is more of a portfolio thesis. Think about a portfolio of companies as opposed to a, a portfolio of products. And when you start to think about that, you start to think, well, how do I build that portfolio? And as we move from corporate venture capital to M&A, people were sort of out, they had scouts, people were out searching, oh, wow, I need this to help my company and go out and find it. And that was finding a needle in a haystack and it wasn't quite the right fit. Uh, and so companies now are really looking at this corporate venture new business model where they're actually taking all the ideas from the company. And I think that's that's a different approach as well, as opposed to saying, hey, our senior executives, let's get in a room and figure out how we can innovate. Is to your point, Austin, I think you mentioned you could see all kinds of ways to improve efficiency or reduce waste or improve the customer experience. And how do we create an idea management funnel so that those ideas can be generated across the company and really condensed into those that are most viable to be a business. So we've seen people become more disciplined around idea management and then also thinking about these things as a portfolio, just like you would as a venture capitalist, as a company in terms of creating enterprise value through new businesses and and whether those are spinning those out or keeping them in as a way to not just rely on organic growth, but, but truly disruptive models. And, and so that's, that's, I think, what we're seeing a lot of right now is um, thinking about actually how to sell things to your competitors, how to cannibalize your own market share. So we're seeing much more of that because things have shifted so uh, fundamentally that people are willing to think out of the box more than they were before, really transformationally. Yeah, I think it's an indicator of where we are today, right? I mean, it, it's, I'm not that old. I I think I'm older than Landon, but I'm not that old of a person, right? But, you know, I was born in the 70s. I think back to when I was a kid and I feel like so little changed, right? And now I think about my son that's 20 and my daughter that's 17 and what's been introduced from just from a technology standpoint since they've been alive it's awe-inspiring to realize just how much innovation has taken place over the last 20 years that I've been a parent, right? Yeah. And I try to just even fathom for me, and, and you're you know more of an innovator than I am, and you're working with innovators every day, but I just try to fathom what the future would even look like now, you know, thinking, gosh, there's more computing power in the palm of my hand with my iPhone compared to the first computer that my family owned, right? And and so those types of things are just awe-inspiring to me. But, you know, now I have to, we have to, we're all looking forward and we have to be looking forward. And our young entrepreneurs are forcing us to always be looking forward, which is fantastic. So for you and, and the, in, you know, the interactions that you have with innovators every day, I'd love to hear, you know, three to five predictions from you on the, on the future of innovation and, and what you might think is the, the next industrial revolution. Yeah, I think definitely um, the opportunity for artificial intelligence and machine learning to drive personalization and insights. I think that's just everything is going to be infused with some type of, whether you call it data science or data analytics, but the ability, we, we have so much information. And I think about information as like exhaust. It's just coming out of the car and we're not harnessing it. But the ability to actually start to harness that information and drive insights is going to be revolutionary. So a lot of times we think of artificial intelligence as you know a machine reading something that a human could do, but it really is about providing humans insights to make better decisions. And I think that's just going to drive 
a lot of innovation. And I, I think I start to think a lot about the global supply chain. You know, when Instacart uh, was was sending shoppers into grocery stores, it was like, why does an Instacart, why does anyone have to go to a grocery store to get the supplies? Like, isn't there a warehouse or couldn't they drive through? And so I think there's going to be major disruptions in the supply chain. You know, you hear farmers throwing out food. And, um, and so I think that that's certainly right for innovation. If you look at Walmart, Walmart's business model was built on a more efficient supply chain. And yeah. I think there's major opportunities for supply chain efficiencies. And then I think healthcare is hugely ripe for this. Um, you know, with the amount of unemployment that we have right now, um, you know, Medicaid and safety net opportunities for how to better support people uh, in their homes, aging in place for seniors, or just how we provide more social support services. I, I've got a, a huge heart for social impact and, and technology driving social impact. And I think that there's um, tremendous opportunity to use technology to um, provide culturally competent, language specific, health literacy tools and communication that that is also being, um, I think, fostered in a time of pandemic as well. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I, I think there's, I mean, you already mentioned just the fact that when this whole COVID-19 pandemic started, that telemedicine was not approved for payment for Medicaid and Medicare, right? Mm-hmm. And And so I think, I'm not trying to get political in any way, shape or form, but a lot of times government regulations will get in the way of innovation, whether it's healthcare or many other things, the regulations can can get in the way of of what we really need to innovate. And so we, I think we've got to figure out a better system. Period for an interaction between the government and the private sector to understand really what's what works best for our economy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I I mentioned on last week's show, I think it was that, you know, somebody had asked me a a question via direct message on one of the social media channels about what I thought was going to happen. Will the economy and the stock market rebound and, you know, all those sorts of things. And and my response was, well, first, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to tell you how the economy is going to recover, right? But here's what I, here's what I can tell you is that entrepreneurs and innovators are going to build And they're going to innovate and they will figure out a way for us to come out of this, right? I think the government has to jump in from a safety net standpoint and they did, right? But it's really going to be up to the the business owners and the entrepreneurs to to build our way out of this. I mean, 99% of the businesses in this country are small businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the guy down the street from you that's going to do something unique and innovate something unique that's going to revolutionize something in healthcare or, you know, AI or any of the other things that, that are ripe for, for disruption. Yeah, this is a great time to start a business. It really is. Yeah. And I think the other um, piece that's interesting, you mentioned before the, the speed of disruption and, and um, the implementation of new technology and innovation, um, regulation can't keep up. And that was part of the issue, I think, around not allowing telehealth and certainly some of the AI. And, and I, I talk uh, quite a bit about this around digital therapeutics is if you do a randomized controlled trial on a drug, what you release into the market is what you did the randomized controlled trial on. If you think about AI driven digital therapeutics and some other types of technology, it is inherently always changing and improving. It can never look like the thing that you did that randomized controlled trial. And so where does that oversight come from? Um, how do you create uh, standardized performance metrics? So it, it actually um, causes a lot of need for controls that don't exist today. And so I think that's, that's, that's part of the reason why regulation has a hard time keeping up with especially things around health and protected health information. Um, but this has been a good for, good for those technologies in healthcare, the realization that um, more things have to happen in the homes, more data connectivity and interoperability needs to happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, that, that we won't take a step backwards when this is over. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, and Landon mentioned this earlier, the telemedicine. I mean, we've had, you know, my daughter has a thyroid condition and, you know, some other things that, that she has to have regular follow-ups for. Well, mm-hmm. we've, we've had telemedicine follow-ups instead of in-person follow-ups. And I start to realize that there's probably never a reason for us to ever go see the doctor in person for that type of follow-up. I don't have to get in the car 
and drive across town and and go into the office. You know, the only thing that we had to do was get labs separately at the lab. And then my daughter stood on the scale at home, right? And then everything else is just the doctor talking back and forth. And so why do we have to be there in person? And, and it's that's just one example of how things have changed and will probably be this way going forward. Um, well, I know it's a, a national program, but I think we're we're benefited by Arizona being a a um, startup and business friendly environment because we have like the um, the fintech fintech sandbox, right? So you can come in and experiment in different financial models and, and business models independent of the regulation that's uh, governing those industries. And so, and I said, gosh, we need an insure tech sandbox and some other sandbox here. Yeah. But the fact that we have sandboxes and that, um, you know, we, we have two-sided marketplaces here when where we've decided those are 1099 employees, they're not full-time employees. And that's really driving an explosion in those two-sided human capital markets. And it's a good place here in Arizona to, to start a business. We've got a great um, ecosystem. And I think over the last couple of years, I've really tried to become more you know, part of that. I joined the, the board of directors of the Startup AZ Foundation and really diving into how can we continue to foster and support entrepreneurs and that, that journey through you know, mentorship and support so that the, maybe for them, the speed bumps are a little bit lower in, in their journey because of the, some of the, the, the PTSD we all have uh, <laughs> uh, from our own entrepreneurial journeys. So, but, yeah. uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I got it. Let me jump in real quick, Austin. I just want to make sure I don't uh, forget this question because I feel like it's going to be really valuable for, for our listeners. You know, Brenda, you have a really unique situation, right? You've, you've bootstrapped, you've consulted with huge companies. You, you, you know, you've, 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 you've got a leadership role. You've worn so many different unique hats and I think it would be really valuable for our, our listeners if you could just for a couple minutes give us some some thoughts, suggestions, tips, tricks, anything that you think would be worth sharing with some of these smaller businesses, Brenda, that may not have access to uh, you know the resources or the capital to have these outside you know uh, groups or 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 non affiliated companies. You know what are some of these smaller businesses? What are some things that that they can do or or think about or put in place so that as they start to think about their potentially new business model coming out of this pandemic, that they can, you know, really hit the ground running. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually um, teach entrepreneurship at NYU. So I've got, you know, 18 graduate students, none of whom actually probably want to be an entrepreneur, but they have to take this class. And, and, Sometimes people develop a technology and they go out and look for a problem. They're trying to look for a problem that they solve. And so I, I say, just start with a problem. You can probably find five problems that you are frustrated with in your work life or your personal life that find a problem. And then go out and you don't have to build a thing. Go out and validate that that's a problem for other people and that whatever you're thinking about is a solution that would solve that problem. And 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 start there. And so I think people think that they have to go out and spend a bunch of money or build a bunch of technology. They don't. It's it's really around getting product market fit right. And then once you have, you know, you've got product market fit, um, you can get a letter of intent or an MOU to say, if I built this thing, would you buy it? Now, all of a sudden, I know, hey, if I built this thing, um, somebody's going to buy it. And, and so part is, is product market fit. The other is sell to the right person. A lot of folks go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this accelerator or I'm going to you know, do a pilot. There's no aligned incentives to actually scale your uh, innovation. In, they're just learning, right? And so I also say, find the person who your solution hits their P&L. Right, like like you're solving a PNL problem for someone. If you're not selling to someone who's your problem impacts their PNL, um, you're probably not sol- um, selling to the right person. So that that persona and who you're selling to becomes really critically important. And then I think that the third part is really understanding again the the persevere, pivot, perish. Um, and the older I've gotten, the the more I trust my gut with that. You know, when when hey, you talk about grit and persevere, and there's a place for that. You've got to be just really passionate around your with your business model to, to get you up every day and put as much work as it takes to be an entrepreneur. But there's times you just got to say, you know what? I gave it my best and I, this isn't, people don't want this. And maybe just pivoting 30% is, 
is going to be the right way to go. So I think there's probably um, some entrepreneurs out there that that need to do some evaluation of their business model right now, given where we are and say, hey, is it time to to persevere, pivot or perish? Um, those are probably the, the three things early on. Um, don't overbuild. You know, you can have the wizard behind the screen early on and be scrappy and pivot and figure it out and be like a little U-boat and be very, very competitive with when with the entrenched incumbents that have a really hard time, um, you know, pivoting the the big freighter tray for freighter boat. So, <laughs> but anyway, that, that those are typically where folks don't really understand how do I build an MVP? How do I go? To, how do I validate the idea? Um, and when do I know when I should should persevere or not? So those are the sorts of things that I think that um, experience. There's a lot of wisdom with experience. Yeah, agreed. I'll definitely hold on to the uh, persevere, pivot, or perish. I haven't heard it put that way before. So that uh, you know the the three P's. I'll, the three uh, that P's. has nothing to do with the PPP loan, right? Yeah. Just- <laughs> no, no, no. A whole other topic for a whole other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, yes. we could do a whole episode on that, actually. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. well, let's take this opportunity to uh, hear a word from our, our next sponsor, and then uh, I've got some follow-up for you, Brenda. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm. We're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. Okay, so to go back to the uh, persevere, pivot, or perish, and uh, you know, looking for a problem, so to speak, to solve rather than building something and then trying to figure out a way to sell it. Uh, I, th- I think that that's a, a great lesson for a lot of entrepreneurs to learn, right? And and sometimes it you know it doesn't even have to be a product, right? I mean, you look for a problem of something that somebody's not doing well enough, right? I mm-hmm. mean, Netflix did that with Blockbuster, for example. I personally, in my past a decade or so ago, had an opportunity to participate in a business that's completely unrelated to what I do day in and day out. But it was an opportunity to take that particular business, which was you know, construction type business, residential and commercial type construction business, and just do it better than anybody else does it in that space, right? And so, you know, they were, they were notoriously not including technology and in what they did in the bidding soft, you know, creating a bidding software, even, a, even just a simple Excel-based bidding software for clients to be able to see exactly what it is that they're paying for and why, and showing up on time and, you know, wearing clean clothes, for example, you know, those sorts of things are, are a differentiator in the construction industry. It can be as simple as that, right? It's just, it's just about identifying a problem and saying, what can I do better that would be beneficial to the public? And then how do I build a business around that? Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of young entrepreneurs will say, well, there's no room there. There's already someone in that market. And I said, well, the fact that there's someone in that market is a good thing because they've already validated that the market size is... Um, but some of the one of the best ways to get into the market is to follow an ineffective competitor. They've gone out, they've built the market, they've sold the benefit of that particular solution, if you will, to them. And you can come in with a better mousetrap and not have to go out and actually convince people that, 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 that they have the problem that you're trying to solve. So, so following an ineffective competitor is actually a great opportunity to, um, to get there faster and quicker. Um, and and those, those examples are, are all over the place, some early market entrants. And I think that's one of the reasons why corporations need to continually disrupt themselves or somebody or someone else will. So yeah. I think it's it's that they just don't have a, a sort of a method for commercializing their best innovation ideas um, and 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 moving at the speed that a startup has. You know, it just it just takes a long time. So those are the some of the things that I'm just excited to to do at Coplex is has really helped those larger corporations move at the speed of the market and the disruption that's happening outside of their their typical way that they look at doing that. Yeah, so maybe you can actually give us some examples of of things that, you know, and I know you're newer to Coplex, but what are some things that you're doing specifically with, you don't have to give specifics on companies or anything like that, but but what is it that 
that you're doing to help them foster this idea of innovation and, and making Coplex be a part of, you know, really a partner to them in, in innovating inside of a larger organization, as well as with small organizations and what you do to help incubate and those sorts of things? Yeah, so we really have three different um product offerings, if you will, business segments that we've just recently launched. One is what we're calling Coplex Inside. So how do we do exactly what you said? Go into organizations and help them harness the ideas, the innovation ideas, rank and score those efficiently through an idea management system, uh, validate those in the market, start to do experiments to understand even um, which way to go in terms of those strategies, and then ultimately um, build an MVP technology, the design, and, and and either spin them out or keep them in. That was one of the ahas when I got uh, started looking into Coplex. I'm, I was looking at the team and I said, why do you have seven developers? Like, who are these designers? And I thought they were more just like a, an accelerator that brought businesses in and, and put them through a process. We're actually building the technology and we're, we're de-risking those businesses because we've done this now you know, over 300 times. So there's, there's pattern recognition. Oh, you have a two-sided marketplace. We know exactly how to build that. Oh, you have this. And so, you know, they're all digital business models now um, where for a young startup or even a company to say, I want to build an MVP. Now, where do I go find developers? You typically don't have those kind of folks um, building that sort of scrappy V1 MVP within a large company. And then you're like, well, where do I go find them? And so the opportunity to partner with, uh, Coplex to complement the company for either capacity or capability demands or, or gaps is something that I think is really interesting. So we've got the Coplex inside. So um, the portfolio management, the, the training around lean methodologies. Um, and then we have our, our startup studio. And that really is where we're partnering with them to um, identify and spin out companies um, as, a, as a portfolio. And then we've got our startup services, design, dev, security, uh, strategy, analytics, that we can partner with P- VC or PE-backed companies to do that SaaS audit or to help them pivot or to uh, augment their dev and design team. So those are really the three, the startup services, the startup studio, and Coplex Inside is where we're expanding the original founder-led um, business startup model that, that has been in place at Coplex for the last few years. That's interesting. So if, if I'm a founder today or I, I think I have an idea that's that's worth exploring, how does somebody reach out to Coplex, get connected with them? And and I, I'd even ask you to take a step farther and, and go beyond Coplex and say, you know, somebody's listening today who thinks that they have an idea that's worth exploring and that they can build a business around, or they're identifying a problem and they've they've found something. What steps would you say to them that they need to to take? So what organizations should they join? What meetings should they go to? How do they how do they get in touch with Coplex? That sort of thing. For those of you in Phoenix, I would definitely get involved in the um, Arizona Commerce Authority. They have an Arizona Innovation Challenge every year. What's phenomenal about that, I was actually a judge this year, is there were a lot of companies that are not ready to win the Arizona Innovation Challenge, but they may apply four or five times because you have 10 seasoned people giving you feedback on your business. And so that feedback is just incredibly valuable. Um, There's a startup Arizona um, uh, foundation that runs a collective, so a group of cohorts. There's a lot of CEO um, support groups here in town uh, where people get together and support each other. So absolutely get plugged into a galvanize or a cahoots, or there's all these folks wanting to help and support the, the entrepreneurial community. So that would be the first thing and get out there and just start to validate the business model and get, get lots of advice from people. Um, related to Coplex, uh, typically founders come to us, either um, a small business who says, hey, I'm running my business, but I have a great idea for a different business. I really want you guys to help me build it. And we'll actually place an operator in that business as a spin out from a, a large company or just a small business. And, and then founders come to us with ideas and they said, hey, you know, we've had doctors and dentists and other folks come and say, hey, I have some money and I have an idea. I have absolutely no, no idea how to build this business. And so they come through our structured nine to 12 month program. And after nine months, they go from idea to seed funding. And, you know, when they graduate, it's when they get seed funding and then we sort of send them on their way. But um, Coplex's business model is to not really make money on taking people through the program. We take warrants in the in the in the 
companies that come through our program. So the value of Coplex is really the value of the warrants we have. So we have very aligned incentives in making sure that those companies are successful long-term. Sure. So, and, and as a similar model with the, the corporations that we have long-term aligned incentives to find the best ideas, execute against those and commercialize those ideas and help them be successful. I think that's so valuable to be able to get that feedback, right? Whether it's whether it's at Coplex or just other people that you may know that have some background in something, right? Whether it's the type of idea that you're looking at or the business that you're that you're thinking about starting, having outside feedback that's unbiased and can give you some, you know, I mean, you're you're technically biased, right? Because like you said, the warrants and you're, you're, <laughs> you're aligned to help them, but, but you're also not going to spend your time, your energy, your resources to help them build something if you don't see that it's going to turn into a viable opportunity right. for, for Coplex or for the founder. And I would say more often than not, when a founder comes to us with an idea, it's, it pivots. Um, once you actually start going out and doing a lot of the, um, we call it assumption testing, so we do a whole lean canvas and then we have, you know, it's filled with assumptions. And so we said, we assume that. And then we, we list all the assumptions we just made and then we force rank them. Okay, what are the most important assumptions that we just made that if we got that wrong, um, it would impact our ability to launch this business. And so then we go out and we create experiment cards and we go out and we test all of those assumptions. And, and that discipline and rigor around the process early on saves a lot of heartache later. And I think that's that startup methodology is is what's been helpful. But almost all of them pivot, you know, early early on as you're learning more um, around what the market actually wants, and, and that um, speed to to market I think is important. That speed to speed to information. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's kind of fun. Something coming up here in August. Hopefully, we can have it on site. Is Coplex partnered with um, ASU, their Heal Lab, and the Maricopa? County Medical Society. And so we're spending two days, we're getting healthcare workers together, physicians, but also nurses, dentists, and leaders in their field and saying, hey, here's how you guys can become entrepreneurs. And here's what that process looks like. And, and going through all the, here's what legal looks like, and here's regulation, and here's how you should think about it. And here's the methodology. So I'm really excited about that to combine medical practice, healthcare practitioners with the lean startup. And we're going to have some fun speakers. Um, Robert Gross, who's the chief medical officer at Banner is going to be on a panel and some other folks who are, um, you know, it, even with the large institutions, innovators in this community. I think um, it, I, I like to see those um, sort of disparate stakeholders come together and start supporting entrepreneurship more broadly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Brenda, we very much um, will be excited to have you on the show again sometime in the, in the, in the near future, because we want to, we want to hear more about your, your progress that you're making with all your endeavors. But um, I think it would be really cool, Brenda, just to hear, you know, a couple minutes as we're pushing up against time here, where do you see yourself in the next handful of years? You, you've accomplished a lot in your career and you've given back to the community in so many, so many ways. Um, I can't imagine that you have a lot of free time on your hands right now, but <laughs> assuming that your, some of your time does free up in the future, where do you, where do you see yourself and what do you, what do you see yourself doing in the next, you know, three, three, five years? Yeah, well, I'm actually co-founding another company. I, I when I left Solera, um, I uh, joined up with a co-founder actually in San Diego to really have a brand new market model in healthcare. And it's going to take a couple of years to get that off the ground. And I told the Coplex people, I'm like, hey, I've got this side thing over here I'm working on, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I, I'm putting some energy into that. It's actually a mutual membership and market exchange as a proxy for single payer in the healthcare system to actually extract value for things that have a long-term ROI like social determinants of health. So spending some time there, I like big market, I like making markets. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about white space and, and making markets. So I think I have a, a you know, I'm, I'm committed to Coplex. I'm super excited about the business. I think I have another couple startups in me after this. I would love to write a book. Um, and I actually love to teach. So now I'm, I'm part-time at NYU, but you know, I don't think, I always said retirement is when you hate what you do and you want to stop doing it. So I can't imagine like not working, sure. <laughs> but you know, the start thing is hard. I probably got a couple more, you know, I've got complex for uh, several years and then probably a couple more after that. And, um, 
but I really love um, mentoring. I like teaching. I wouldn't mind writing a book. So again, taking a pack- packaging up 30, 35 years of of wisdom and, and maybe helping some other folks um, in their on their journey is, is something I'd really like to do. I, I think cool. that, yeah, I think that's awesome. We uh, actually, our guest last week, I don't know if you listened to the show, but our guest last week has a program that he put together with the guy who wrote, I'm blanking on his name right now, Mark something Hansen uh, wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mark Victor Hansen wrote Chicken yeah, Soup Victor. for the Soul. And so he, he partnered with him to, uh, to help entrepreneurs or really anybody who wants to, to write their own book. And it's, it's called, there's, there's a bestseller in, in you essentially is, is what it is. And so yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah, a it's fantastic old, program. You, yeah. You can self publish just like you can put music out on the internet. And, um, but that's, that is, um, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to, I'll definitely have to, to check that out. But I know, you know, I bootstrapped, uh, the first company Viridian and I didn't know anything about institutional capital. I, 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 I didn't even know how to give away equity to advisors. <laughs> I was, people thought it was stingy. I'm like, I just don't know how it works. And so I, uh, when I started going out and saying, Hey, I need to raise some money to build a technology platform for Solera. Um, I went out and I bought venture capital for dummies. Like, Literally, like, because that's it, that's the only, you know, and so there's room for books out there around, you know, entrepreneurship. I'm sure there's an entrepreneurship for dummies, but, you know, there's definitely like sort of a stepwise. Here's everything that you need to know at a very elementary level to start those conversations and prepare yourself for success. So there's no doubt about it. And I I think that the reality is, regardless of whether there's 150,000 books on entrepreneurship out there, Brenda Schmidt's journey and the way that you view it is different than those people, right? Well, I think it's interesting, even just being a female entrepreneur, that journey is just different. You know, we, it really, there is a gender difference. And, and I would also, it's funny, I say, whether it's a girl or a, or a guy, I go, you know, le- less PowerPoint, more Excel. You know, I, I tend to be <laughs> words. I'm a very visual person, but at the end of the day, those are our financial decisions and financial buyers and less PowerPoint, more Excel. And so people get all worried about how things look and go, you know, at the end of the day, it's the numbers. Um, so there's a lot of, of learnings um, through that, that journey as well. But I think just, um, you know, venture capital PE, they look for pattern recognition. And so when a female entrepreneur walks in the door, we don't necessarily match pattern recognition. And I think that's part of the, part of the problem. Or they'll yeah. say you have to have a co-founder. I'm like, who says 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 who? You know. Yeah. And so I, I really I have got six or seven female entrepreneurs that I mentor informally, and you know, share that experience as well in terms of you know your advisors are there to help you, not tell you what to do. And you know, we're your experts, not an order taker. And you know, just really be confident in your ability to do this, which is sometimes, you know, as an entrepreneur, often you feel like a fraud, (laughs) but, uh, you know, that's a whole nother podcast around, you know, the fake it till you make it early on. But, uh, um, but no, it's, it's been a really fascinating journey. And, um, you know, once you're an entrepreneur, it's really, really hard. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, it it would be really hard to go back to work for somebody else at this point, I think. And 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 you're right. I mean, I, I was going to mention it earlier that one, our country does not have enough female entrepreneurs, period. It, it's a problem. It's something that that I think needs to be fixed. And obviously, you're mentoring young women and, and working with them to to help them, you know, get on that path themselves, which I think is admirable. Um, but I would tell you that, you know, Landon and I come from a very male driven industry. And we would love to see more females in our industry. It would help tremendously in a lot of ways, right? But I can also tell you that in the 20 years that I've been in this industry and, you know, I've been in the workforce longer than that, almost without fail, the best leaders that I've had ever were all females. And so I have a a tremendous amount of of, uh, respect for female entrepreneurs and female business unit leaders, for example. Um, I, I think that their approach and the way that they handle things in in many, many ways is better than than men do it. So I take my hat off to you for what you've what you've built and what you're doing to help build the next generation of female entrepreneurs. Landon, anything else you wanna mention before we wrap up? Or Brenda, anything else that you'd like to add? And you can tell us how to get a hold of Coplex and what we should do to uh, to help entrepreneurs in our in our community. Yeah, if you want to uh, reach out to Coplex, it's coplex.com. Um, on social, hello, Coplex, uh, Instagram, Twitter, 
I'm a big LinkedIn fan. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, Brenda G. Schmidt on LinkedIn is a great way to connect. And um, I, I have a lot of conversations and it's, it's funny. I have a lot of great LinkedIn relationships and I may see somebody two years later and it, it feels like a relationship. So um, LinkedIn is always a great way to reach out to me. Email is Brenda at Coplex.com. Yeah. Well, LinkedIn's how we got connected and, and got you on the show to begin with. So I can, I can attest to that being the truth. <laughs> great. Brenda, can, can, can we please, can we get a verbal commitment from you right now that you will join us again sometime in the next 12 months? I would love to. Okay. Yeah. We'd love, love to hear more about uh, what you're working on and what progress you've made and, and just, uh, just get some more advice and insight from you. So really appreciate your time today. Super valuable, lot to take away. So thank you for joining us today. All right. Thank you so much, Landon, Austin. Till next time. I'm actually going to add one more thing to that, Brenda. I'm, I'm going to ask that you bring one of your founders uh, from Coplex to join you and, and tell the story of what Coplex has done for them. Perfect. Would love to. All right. Well, thank All you right. very much. All right. Take care. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson, a certified financial planner professional with our sponsor, Backbone Financial, a comprehensive financial planning practice specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Backbone Financial is based in Scottsdale, Arizona, and represents clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin and the featured tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.